Thank you, Peg, and thank you, Paola and Stefano, for inviting me. Beautiful Erice, of course. Thank you also to uh, Melissa for introducing this morning a lot of the concepts I'm going to need for this talk, so that's going to save me quite a bit of time. So, um, <clears throat> why am I studying, why am I interested in sex partner preference and homosexuality in particular? It's because when I was a, a young scientist, that's me like 30, 30 years ago, I, I discovered this, this fact that you can actually change the phenotypic sex of an animal, Japanese quail in this case, with a single injection in the egg. And um, Elizabeth Atkins had shown that estradiol injected into a male egg which completely demasculinized the behavior, and we showed that blocking estrogen production in females does the opposite, so the females retain the male sexual behavior. <clears throat> and of course, there's no need at this point now to tell you that the same thing takes place in rats. That was already mentioned several times, so sex hormones, testosterone and estradiol masculinize, defeminize the absence of hormones. You keep a feminine phenotype. This was the whole story until about 20 years ago when came this infamous um, zebra finch that was already presented to you today. So the zebra finch was half male, half female, and interestingly, it had on the male side a much larger HVC, the sun control nucleus, than on the female side. So something had to happen that was not driven by the gonadal hormones, since it, obviously both sides of the brain were exposed to the same hormones from the gonads, which doesn't mean that they had the same level of sex steroids, because the brain can produce sex steroids, we know also. But anyway, so we had to come with this alternative model to the initial Jost and Phoenix um, model of sexual differentiation, in which in addition to the genetic sex inducing the gonadal sex and their hormones inducing the phenotype, you have some more direct effect from the genes on the final phenotype. So the whole story is essentially uh, summarized here, and you've, we've seen versions of this and we'll see more. So on the Y chromosome, you have this SRY uh, gene, which induces a formation of a testis, produces testosterone, which by itself or through aromatization produces a male phenotype. The female phenotype develops essentially in the absence of these hormones, although Charlotte told you that during puberty, estrogen also is also important for feminizing at least the, the, the rat uh, phenotype. And then, of course, this leads to the sex of the animals, and then adult steroids will have activating effects, and then the environment socialization will lead eventually to gender, which derives from sex, is not completely independent, which can be discussed to, to various degrees. <clears throat> so that's the background. You've heard this already, so there's no need to spend more time on this. Now, let's get to sexual orientation and essentially the concept of homosexuality, uh, homosexuality versus heterosexuality. Is this due to biology or is this due to education, environment, and social factors? Well, tough question. It's hard to answer. You could, of course, consider, and I'm going to do this in the <clears throat> next few minutes, that homosexuality is actually a reversal of sexual attraction and sexual preference. So, Men are attracted to women, women are attracted to men, and homosexual men and homosexual women are attracted to the opposite sex of what happens in the largest, larger population of control subjects. This diagram is somewhat similar to what I showed you before about sex differentiation. So does this have any validity? <clears throat> well, it has been shown in animal models, and there are several studies, there's probably a half a dozen studies now, that show that the perinatal hormones can actually sex reverse the uh, sex partner preference of rats and mice. This is probably, I think, the, the first study that showed this. It was done by Julie Bakker when she was uh, performing her PhD work in Rotterdam under the supervision of um, Cool Slob. And she showed that in these three compartment chambers, the uh, control males were obviously more interested in estrous female, and the control female were interested with act by active males. But if you were blocking aromatization of testosterone during the two weeks surrounding the, the birth, so the week before and the week after, you were to a large extent sex reversing the animals, and now the males were actually interested in other males and letting other males mount them, although they were not fully sex reversed. There are several other experiments of that type that have been done in rats and mice and that show the same sort of phenomenon. Of course, these are animals, and the question is, how does this relate to humans? <clears throat> well, in humans, we know that there are lots of sex differences. This was mentioned. That's the topic of this, uh, this school, actually. And these sex differences result from various, various uh, factors. 
One of them, of course, at the very basis is that there are genetic differences between males and females. There are about 100 genes on the Y chromosomes, which are expressed in males only. And then on the female, on the female X chromosome, there are a whole bunch of genes that are supposed to be exp exposed, expressed in higher density in females than in males. Now there's a phenomenon called X inactivation, which is preventing this so that you don't have a whole lot of sex difference, but the number of genes escape inactivation, and this results also in additional differences. So we have essential difference in the morph morphology, in cognitive skills, brain structure, incidence of neural disease that was mentioned already, and then in the field of reproductive behavior, sexual orientation and sexual identity or gender identity, these are actually the two differences that show the largest effect size. This was mentioned by, uh, by Melissa this morning. Effect size for gender identity is about 10 to 12. For sexual orientation, it's about 6. So this is a huge difference, which make, means that it's actually easier to study than small differences in cognitive skills, for example, that have a, an effect size of 0.2 or something like that. <clears throat> and we know, of course, that hormones with in, which induce the sex differences in animals are still present in humans. They're still active during sexual differentiation in humans. Their receptors in the brain are still present roughly in the same locations as they are in rats and mice. And they have effects on a number of characteristics, the most obvious one being, of course, the, the genitalia, where you can see that under the influence of testosterone, the undifferentiated um, genital structure will differentiate into a penis and a scrotum, while in female, the structure will remain a clitoris and the, the vaginal opening. We know that this is actually taking place in humans, not because we've done the key manipulation that have been done in animals, which consist in castrating the animals and injecting them with testosterone. That's, of course, impossible in humans. But we know from the CAH girl, for example, who are exposed to too much testosterone or androgens during the prenatal period, that they will develop genital morphology that resemble those of males, and sometimes they're completely masculinized. And on the other hand, we know that from the androgen-insensitive XY individual that they will develop female morphology. So these hormones are still active in humans. Now, do they have any impact on sexual differentiation of the brain and of sexual preferences? Most common explanation that you will find in the popular press are that, uh, are that sexual orientation is defined by interaction that you have in early age. These are the Freudian explanations. They have largely disappeared in many parts of the world. They're still very popular in France, and that's part of the thing that I was actually trying to fight with my book. There is also this... Uh, say from Simone de Beauvoir, which has had a huge influence, and that's at the base of a whole way of thinking about constructivism, which said essentially more than 50 years ago, 70 years ago, actually, that uh, you're not born a woman, you become a woman. This is way before we knew anything about sexual differentiation, actually, but that's still very popular uh, thinking in France. Now, what's the evidence that sexual orientation is actually influenced, if not determined, by prenatal hormones? Well, we have evidence coming from a number of uh, endocrine conditions, and I'm not going to go through all of them because some of them are actually hard to, um, hard to interpret. The, the, these are experiments of nature, but they're not perfect experiments. Probably the best experiment of nature are the two that are highlighted in green here. They're the CAH girls and then the physical extrophy that I will spend a minute explaining to you. In CAH girl, several studies have shown that there is an increased incidence of homosexuality or at least bisexuality. Uh, this is a, a summary that was prepared by uh, John Mooney a long time ago already, and this was indicating at this point that there was about 35% of the girls who were, uh, were exposed to CAH, which were um, actually displaying a form of bisexuality or, or at least a non-strict heterosexuality. And quite interestingly, the... Uh, impact of the disease was variable depending on, on the, how, how strong the disease was. There are several forms of uh, CAH, of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, that relates to different mutations of, of different enzymes, and so that go from uh, non-classical to simple, simple virilizing and then to salt wasting. And as you can see, the incidence of homosexuality or non-strict heterosexuality, we're talking here about percentage of subject that have a kidney a Kinsey score that's higher than one increases with the different forms. And you see here the actual Kinsey score in the different individuals. 
This is not, of course, an all or none phenomenon. This, the individuals are affected. The percentage of non-heterosexual subject is vastly increased, but this is not completely sex reversal, clearly. Why, we don't know exactly. The other uh, endocrine condition or the other uh, medical condition that provide actually the best evidence for an, an, an endocrine influence, but at the same time, the number of subjects is extremely small, for which we have uh, clear data, is what's called a cloacal or vesical extrophy. So this is a condition where uh, young boys, or baby boys, are born without, uh, essentially without any genital structure and without any uh, formation at the, at the lower end of the body. Uh, but they, it's not an endocrine condition because the testes are normal and, and have presumably produced normal levels of testosterone during uh, embryonic life or fetal life. What's done with these uh, poor, poor children is essentially trying to make a, a, a corrections and reorganize the, 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 uh, the excretion and the u urethra and the, and the anus actually. And usually they will transform into a female morphology since the surgery is actually a lot easier to perform. And in the few cases that have been followed in detail, you can see that despite the fact that these subjects were reconstructed with a female genital morphology, and despite the fact that they were raised as girl, all of them actually showed a, a male typical sexual attraction, so they were attracted to female, which means that presumably, we don't know for sure, the prenatal testosterone had induced this aspect. It must be noticed here also that these subjects are XY subjects, so the genes that I'm going to talk about in a minute were going in the same direction as the hormones in this case. So maybe this explains why the effect is so clear in, in that, that case. So that's, that's one type of evidence that suggests uh, an endocrine condition, an endocrine influence. There's another type of argument that has been uh, made, which is that there are in homosexual subject a number of characteristics which are changed as compared to control heterosexual populations. <clears throat> and these are characteristics that are known to be affected or modulated to some extent by the prenatal testosterone. And there's a whole list that concerns morphology, physiology, some brain structures, some cognitive aspects, and I don't have time to go through all of those, but I will just show you a bunch of examples which are the most demonstrative as far as I can tell. So we're going to go through this in sequence, and they're the ones, again, that are highlighted in, in green. Uh, morphology, the 2D to 4D ratio, that has received a huge amount of, of press. So the, we know that the growth of the bones is actually influenced by testosterone prenatally, and it has been shown that the males have actually a smaller 2D, 4D ratio than the female. And this actually works much better on the right hand than on the left hand for reasons that are completely not understood. So the 2D, 4D ratio is actually smaller in men than in women, and it's decreased in um, homosexual women, in lesbians, suggesting that they were exposed to either a higher level of testosterone as average or a higher action of testosterone during prenatal life. It must be said that this is a very noisy measure of the prenatal testosterone action. This only accounts for 15% of the variance or so. This works only because it's a, such an easy measure that has been done on thousands of subjects. Of course, you can just put your hand on the Xerox machine and then you can measure the fingers. It's, it's done in thousands of subjects. Subject, there are hundreds of papers. But the result is reliable at the group level, at the individual level, it doesn't work. So don't be worried about if your fingers don't look like they should be. <laughs> I'm not very masculine. My wife more masculine than me at that level, so that doesn't matter. <coughs> Okay, um, and importantly, it has been shown in animal models that injecting testosterone decreases that ratio. In, in, it's been done in rats, I'm sure. It's been done, I think, in monkeys as well, and maybe a few. It's been done in pheasants, even in one, one bird species. Another less known study concerns the ratio of long bones, long bones and, and, and other bones. And there's a study by uh, Jim Martin, who was published in Hormones and Behavior, which actually showed that the hand width to length ratio is also sexually different. I shouldn't say dimorphic. Se there is a sex difference. I'm sorry, Peg. And actually, what happens here is that this, this ratio is higher in men than in women. And it has been shown that in lesbians, this ratio is also masculinized, again, suggesting exposure or action of testosterone that's above average before birth. Uh, another difference, another difference, okay, there we go. Uh, 
the autoacoustic emission. This is work by Dennis Fanum at the University of Texas in Austin. He actually, I don't know if he discovered the phenomenon, but he discovered that there's a sex difference in the, in the noises that are made by the inner ear. The inner ear makes small clicks, spontaneous small clicks that you do not understand. We all do them. It's related to the movement of the tympanic membranes. And these clicks are higher in number and amplitude in women than in men. And lesbians show a decreased level number of clicks and amplitude of clicks as compared to control women, heterosexual women, again suggesting a masculinization. This feature has been shown to be masculinized also in sheep, I'm sure, in monkeys and maybe other species. So masculinized by prenatal testosterone. Uh, more, co oh no, 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 we're not there yet. Uh, sexual odors. Um, they are a number of chemical compounds that are either derived from androgens or derived from estrogen which are suspected human pheromones. It's not been shown that there are pheromones for sure, but they might influence sexual choices and they activate the hypothalamus in a sexually differenti differential manner. So in heterosexual subjects, the androgenic compounds activate the hypothalamus of women this is, and uh, the estrogenic compounds activate the hypothalamus of men. And the activation has been measured either by fMRI or by PET scan. And, uh, Ivan Kasavich and her group in Stockholm have shown that there is a sex reversal of those activations in that in homosexual men, they are, homosexual men now have their hypothalamus activated by the male, com male compound and no longer activated by the female compound. In the lesbians, uh, the sex reverse is, is not perfect. They have lost the activation by the androgenic compound, but they have not acquired an activation by the estrogenic compound actually. A more complicated difference, we have two more to go through, is the feedback on LH. Well, it has been shown already this morning several times that the females are able to do an LH surge in response to estrogen, while the males cannot do that. Gunther Derner in the 60s and early 70s showed that homosexual males were actually showing a form of positive feedback. It's not really an LH surge. It's nothing similar to an LH surge in rats and mice. And we don't know whether it's, it, this differentiates under the influence of perinatal hormones, but there is an endocrine difference between homosexual men and, homosexual, and, and heterosexual men in terms of the response to a single injection of estrogen. Now, Derner was a very controversial scientist. He had a political agenda for homosexuals, so his work has been heavily criticized. But actually, Brian Gladue, in the, uh, much later in the 80s, decided to replicate this work, and he was, he was going to try to prove that Gunther Derner was wrong. And actually, these are the data from uh, Brian Gladue, who showed that Derner was right. There is a, an endocrine difference between homosexual and heterosexual subject. We don't know that this relates to the you know, perinatal hormones, but it shows at least that there's something endocrine that's different. And finally, of course, there is the work of Simon Levey, which was also shown this morning, showing that the one group of cells in the anterior hypothalamus called INAH3 is larger in males than in female, in men than in women, and homosexual had a group of cell that was of female side. As you can see again, there is a huge amount of individual variation here, so this cannot explain the whole phenomenon but this contributes to the idea that there might have been something different in terms of, a, of a hormone exposure during the prenatal life in those homosexual subjects. Another critique that was made about those data was that uh, all the homosexuals died from AIDS. This was done during the AIDS epidemic in California. Uh, he had a number of contrast subjects, heterosexual subjects, that, were all, that also died from AIDS. And as you can see here, the distribution is sort of all along the, the range, so that it doesn't seem that the AIDS was responsible for this difference. So you have a lot of indices suggesting that homosexual men and women have been exposed to atypical levels of hormones during early in life, or were exposed to an atypical action of hormone during the period of time, of course, because we cannot discriminate between systemic hormones and action at the local level, and we'll get back to this in a few minutes. Now, if you say homosexuality is caused by an atypical exposure to hormones, you're only pushing the question one step further, of course, because why are there hormones 
secreted in, in unusual amount, or why are they acting in a, in a weird condition, in a weird, weird manner? Uh, we don't have the answer to that. Of course, it could be an external event, and Derner again had shown in the, in the, late, six, in the late 70s, I guess, that they were, there had been an increase in homosexual incidents in Berlin at the time of the end of World War II. And he claimed that this related to the stress, well, the stress in Berlin was obvious, of course. The mother who were pregnant in 1944 in Berlin probably had a very uh, disturbed pregnancy, a very stressful pregnancy. And this went down afterwards, so this is not because it became easier to, to declare one's own homosexuality, but it's, there was something happening there. This has never been replicated. We don't know whether this will hold in other situation. This, of course, uh, reminds me of the work that Peg McCarthy has shown showing that inflammation of the brain can actually modify sexual differentiation. We heard about uh, Peg, uh, P, P, PGE2, actually. PG2, not Peg2, and COX2 before. And <laughs> so it's an interesting type. It's an interesting mistake, right? <laughs> I just noticed now. Uh, <laughs> but it's not intentional. <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe something of that type might happen. But of course, another big explanation might be endocrine disruptors, and we have no data whatsoever on that. So I'm wondering whether we're going to have them in the future. It's, it's going to be very hard anyway. But of course, you come now with the second uh, f angle of this, this question, which is, are there any genetic influences? Because the genes could control, of course, the expression of testosterone metabolizing enzyme to con to con control the androgen receptors, and that could be, a, could be one of part of the explanation. Now, there is absolutely clear evidence that genes participate to the control of sexual orientation, and this comes from, uh, first, the studies of families where when there is a homosexual individuals in one family, the likelihood that there'll be another one is higher than the, in the general population. You might still think that this relates to a differential social factors, but the best control that you can have, it's not a perfect control, but it's a fairly reasonable control, is to compare the true and the, the false twins, so the univitiline and bivitiline twins. And this is a compilation of data that was done by Mickey Diamond in 1993, so it's fairly old now. And it showed that there was always a higher concordance of sexual orientation in true twins, in, in the univitelline twins, than in the false twins. Now, these numbers are extremely high at some point. The first study was showing 100% correspondence, so which means that when one of the twins was homosexual, the other one was always. Subsequent studies showed high, lower percentage, but on average, he was still reporting something like 70% concordance in the true twins versus about 20 in the false twins. This has been recently reanalyzed by a group of research in a paper uh, published by Bailey in 2016. And actually, there is an interesting phenomenon that came out, which is that depending on how you select your population, you're getting a slightly different response. If you target homosexual twins specifically, you find something which is actually qu quite similar to what Mickey Diamond had reported uh, tw some 20 years ago. So you have, this, this is the initial study which was targeted. The average is now 52 versus 17%, it's still pretty big. But if you go from the, just a registry of all the individuals on, 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 uh, in a given country, and then you try to contact all the people, then the difference is much smaller. But the difference is still there, so it, which means that there might be a genetic uh, component into um, into the determination of the sexual orientation. Now, what's the genetic basis of that? I uh, must say that despite a lot of studies that have been performed over the last 20, 25 years, we still do not know. The only thing we know is that there is an association of sexual orientation with markers at the terminal end of the X chromosome, a region that's been called Q XQ28. So this is work that made a lot of noise in the popular press in the 1990s by Dean Hammer, who had selected population of uh, male homosexual with uh, maternal inheritance, and he had shown that there was an association with uh, some uh, markers in the terminal region of the X chromosome. Now this study was 
criticized because it was based on a relatively limited number of subjects, but more recently, 2014, there was a confirmation with hundreds of subjects, and this was done by um, Sanders et al., including uh, Bailey again, and they showed again that there was an association with the X chromosome in addition to an association that they were found was slightly less to the something on the, on the region of the chromosome 8. Now, this is of course still a big region, there are still big regions in the chromosomes. We do not know which genes are involved. Now, if my next slide is what I think it is, it is, yes. So, there are, however, a number of interesting things that happen in the XQ28 region of the, of the chromosome. There is a receptor type 2 for adenine vasopressin. This receptor is not supposed to be heavily expressed in the brain, it's more expressed in the periphery. But of course, knowing what we know about the role of arginine and vasopressin, or vasopressin in, in mammals, based on the work of Larry Young and others that will be presented in the coming days, I'm sure. This is one possible um, tra trail that we, we might want to follow. There's also this gene, which is uh, present in the XQ28, and it relates to, um, to the detection of odor-evoked social behavior. And then there's this gene called melanoma-associated antigen 11, which actually controls androgen sensitivity, which is also in that region, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Now, the last ID that has been pursued to try to, to explain sexual orientation based on um, biological factors relates to epigenetic, of course, since uh, the search for genes has been largely unsuccessful over the years. People started thinking about what might be happening in terms of regulation of gene expression. And uh, not much has come out of that yet. One thing that was found by the group of Eric Villay and uh, Brockland is that there is actually an asymmetry, uh, a difference in the asymmetry of the X chromosome in mothers of homosexual subjects. We don't know what's the mechanism that could be behind that. But if you look at X inactivation, it's, it's supposed to happen randomly in different cells. But there are some, some cases where you have more than 90 cells that inactivate a specific X gene, coming either from the father or from the mother. And this, this kind of phenomenon happens in 4% of the mothers who only have had heterosexual sons, but in 13 or 23% of the mothers who've had one or several homosexual sons suggesting that something might happen at the epigenetic level in those mothers that might have had as a consequence a change in sexual orientation of the sons. Of course, we don't know more about the mechanism. But there's another thing that has come up in the recent year, and this, this is actually a paper uh, that uh, Peg drew my attention to a few years ago, a paper by Rice, which is mostly a theoretical paper. But this paper actually is making the case that the hormones that we always assume are the key factors driving sexual differentiation, the hormones by themselves might not be sufficient to explain what we're seeing. And he's making the point that the difference in testosterone, for example, between males and female embryos is actually present. It's always statistically significant, but there is always quite a bit of overlap, except on very limited periods of time during ontogeny. In rats, there is a single day when there is no overlap between males and females' level of testosterone. In humans, I think there is about two weeks or three weeks when there is no overlap. Otherwise, there is some overlap. The females who have the largest amount of testosterone in their plasma have more testosterone than the males who have very little. And if you think of this, then, of course, you might expect that you should have a huge amount of individuals born with ambiguous genitalia, for example. And that's not the case. So this suggests that something else must control the sensitivity to testosterone. And this something else could be epigenetic marks, could be genes, other genes that are expressed differentially. We know that before, even before the test is developed, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of genes that are expressed differentially in the, blast, in the male and female blastocyst. And some of these genes are autosomes, which means that they must be indirectly controlled by some, sex chrom some uh, genes on the sex chromosomes. And, of course, the action of testosterone between the concentration in the plasma and the phenotypic trade 
is limited by the binding hormones, in, the binding globulins in the plasma, is limited by the metabolis, metabolizing enzyme that will enhance or decrease the action of the hormone, is limited by the receptors and their cofactors. And of course, you can think that some of these steps are controlled differentially in males and females, so that the sensitivity to testosterone is enhanced in males and decreased in females. And for example, we know that 5-alpha reductase is expressed in higher concentrations in, in the sexual skin in males than in females. And this way, this should enhance the ac action of testosterone on the sexual differentiation. Now, if we come back to the sexual orientation now, and I'm coming back to this, this MAGE11 gene. Um, this is a study that was uh, performed by um, Elizabeth Wilson, and she actually sent me the paper after I published my book on, on homosexuality, and she drew my attention to this, to this gene. Well, she told me this gene is actually located in XQ28, as I already told you, and this gene actually increases sensitivity to androgen. It's a co-activator of the receptor. Interestingly, the gene is epigenetically regulated by, by methylation, demethylation. And she has shown that in prostate cancer patients where you decrease the androgen level, either by castration or by using anti-androgens, there is an overexpression of, of this protein due to the demethylation of the genes, up to the point that there is up to a, hundred, a thousand fold increase in expression of, 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 this, of this protein. Uh, you might imagine that this gene, which is located in the XQ28 region, is actually also regulated in the brain by this epigenetic mechanism. We know that this gene actually is not present below primates, so this might explain why sexual orientation and, uh, and uh, sexual homos homosexuality in humans is actually more of a human phenomenon than, uh, than a phenomenon that you can find in rats and mice, unless you induce it with hormones. So maybe there could be a link between this, this protein and the action of androgens in the brain and the sexual orientation. We don't know really. There's a last phenomenon, I have a couple of minutes, that, that might be related to sexual orientation and might control. It does control, actually, sexual orientation to, to some extent, and that's the so-called brother, older brother effect. So this was identified, it's a phenomenon identified by two Canadian scientists, Ray Blanchard and Tony Boggart, who showed uh, many years ago already that there is actually an increased incidence of homosexuality in mothers who are, in sons who are born to mothers who had previously other boys. So each boy born to a mother increases the incidence of homosexuality by 33%, which is quite a huge, a huge phenomenon. Uh, doesn't mean that after three boys, of course, you have 100. You're starting from 4 or 5% in the general population. So you have doubled that number when you reach the third, third boy. They have been speculating about the origin of this phenomenon for a long time. And they showed, namely, that this phenomenon is accompanied by a decrease in weight at birth. It's, it's minimal, a decrease of, of uh, uh, brain, uh, brain weight at birth also. And uh, this is not related to the siblings that are born after. This is not related to the number of boys that are in the family. This is not related to the age of the mother. So this relates to something that's specific to having multiple male embryos developing in a female, female body. And their idea was then that there must be something which is probably immunological. And they actually published last year a paper, well, it's actually two years ago now, a paper showing that there's accumulation in the blood of mothers who had several boys. This accumulation of antibodies to a protein called neurologin 4, which is a, a Y-linked a protein. And this thing accumulates. And these antibodies actually stay in the blood of the mother up to 40 years after these pregnancies. So the idea is that having a foreign body, a foreign embryos developing in your, in your uh, uterus creates an immune reaction, and this immune reaction produces antibodies which will in the subsequent um, pregnancies affect the development of the brain. So the idea is essentially that 
the first, the first child, first male child you'll have, you will increase these anti antibodies in the, in the plasma. You can, you can have female embryos in between and female um, girl born in between that doesn't have any effect. But then as the male embryos accumulate, the amount of antibodies accumulate in the, in the plasma and then you increase the incidence of, uh, of homosexuality. So these are essentially all the phenomena that have been identified that tend to suggest that there are biological influences to sexual orientation be besides eventually some, uh, some uh, social influences. So there are things that are related to hormones, endocrine diseases, stress, other external events, endocrine treatment with, uh, with DES, which I didn't mention, endocrine disruptor potentially, some genetics, some immune reactions. Now, how could a hormone control something as complicated as, uh, as um, sexual orientation? Well, I'm not going to go into detail into these studies, but there's a very nice uh, track that has been uh, suggested by, uh, by Melissa, and she didn't put it in this context, but she put it in the context of gender development, but she showed the, you these data this, this morning. She showed that if you actually train children or you teach children that one type of object is for, for boys or for girls, and this is, can be done either by de a declarative, in a declarative manner or by showing examples, and then you retest those individuals later on, you will see that control females and control boys actually actually follow the pattern essentially that was shown by adults. So if the green balloon is for boys, then the, they, will, they will take the green balloon if, if it was shown by, by people of their own sex. But the CAH girls were actually not following this pattern. They were not, I don't think they were significantly, significantly different from, from random. And it's not a matter of memory, because when they were asked what they had been displayed in the small videos, they could remember perfectly well. But they were not, not using this information. So, in conclusion, I think that there is, as said by Bailey, there is considerably more evidence supporting the idea that there are non-social, which means biological causes to sexual orientation, than social causes. That's one thing. And I think that every single experiment is actually weak, and every single experiment only explains part of the variance, but there's converging evidence suggesting that there are organizational effects of hormone, that there are genetic or epigenetic effects, and that the older brother effects explain a huge part of sexual orientation. And to me, I'm citing something that was already cited earlier during this, this meeting. Um, Dobzhansky said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I think if you think about it, sexual orientation is such an important phenomenon for the survival of a species that it's really hard to me as a biologist to imagine that this phenomenon could have escaped very strict controls by biological phenomena and left open to uh, social influences and uh, factors of that type. Um, so that's all I had to say. Um, I have actually published this book, as Peggy mentioned, Peg mentioned in 2010, about the biology of homosexuality. It was translated in English and then more recently in Greek. And then this is the last book that I just published, but it's, uh, it's in French so far, so maybe there'll be an English translation. We don't know at this point. Thank you for your attention.